What's up, guys? It's your boy Omni Sensei back with part 13 of What If A Serial Killer Reincarnates in Naruto as Blind Swordsman. If you enjoy this series, drop a like down below. It only takes a second, and it's free, and while you are down there hit that subscribe button. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Having said that, let's get into it. POV narration. Get rid of the lake, huh? The Jinchuriki of the one-tailed beast sighed before seemingly choking on sand. The sand cloud underneath him immediately started growing bigger and bigger, while the Tsuchika Jinoki and the third Kazuki H flew to the side, not wanting to get caught in what was to come. A beastly roar came from the skies as the Jinchuriki's figure expanded rapidly, quickly turning into a behemoth of a beast. Ken tilted his head slightly as he felt the one-tailed beast manifest into the world, much less controlled than the Jinchuriki he had previously met. The roar sounded completely inhuman, and the blind monster couldn't help but find the appearance of the one-tailed beast amusing. A gigantic raccoon with a gigantic spiky tail that felt like it was made completely out of sand. Its tail seemed to swing around wildly, even trying to attack its allies, the two cage. Both of them seemed to be expecting something like that to happen, it became rather clear to anyone paying attention, that the Jinchuriki of the one-tailed beast didn't have much control over it. Ken assumed that the lack of control didn't have much to do with power and more with the temperament of the tailed beast. After all, it couldn't have been less controllable due to his power. This one seems a bit weaker than the others I felt Ken couldn't help but comment, while the shark-like water around him continued shredding up the shinobi that had been caught in his whirlpool. Despite it being hardly controlled, it still seemed to single out Ken in the middle of that lake, its eyes widening slightly before narrowing in anger. Ken fell confused for a moment, before shaking his head. I guess it's not a fan of my existence, an abomination spawned from father's nightmares. My esteemed self shall be the one to get rid of you. The beast spoke fluently, his speech only slurred by its beastly growls. Ken just shook his head. You aren't the first one to try but fine, give it your best shot. Ken cracked his neck and slowly crouched down, preparing to lounge at the sand monster. Be buried in a sea of sand. In an instant, all of the tailed beast's chakra moved, and out of its tail, spawned a torrent of sand so large that it seemed to completely stomp out the lake that Ken was crouching on. Most of the shinobi on the sideline seemed to have already started fleeing from the vicinity of the lake, already expecting such a thing to happen. Ken wasted no time in growing his wings, they batted once, sending him flying backwards. He crossed the distance from the middle of the lake to its shore in a split second, not even being clipped slightly by the torrent of sand. The lake was immediately submerged in sand, but the torrent continued, inundating the surroundings and forcing Ken to fly upwards. Despite feeling weaker in chakra, its abilities seemed more annoying to deal with than those of the seven-tailed beast. I didn't want to waste too much chakra here, but getting rid of these, Ken lamented as his body transformed, scales growing all over his body, as his muscles twitched and grew thicker, his entire bill turning sturdy. Steam came out of the corners of his mask as he huffed some hot air into the wind, ignoring the sand that was constantly surging towards him. It enveloped him fully at that moment, forming a gigantic cocoon of sand around him. Cheers erupted from the surrounding shinobi as they witnessed the monster that had shredded their comrades apart, finally losing some ground. But their cheers turned to silence swiftly, as all of the sand around the blind monster was blown away, all seemingly done in a single whip of the tail. TSK, sit still and die. The giant raccoon groaned in frustration as its sand seemed to compress underneath Ken, forming two gigantic compressed hands that grabbed at him from both sides. But the blind assassin was not about to just sit there and allow himself to get caught so easily. San was annoying to get out of clothing at the end of the day. His wings flapped once more, sending him flying upwards with a shockwave large enough to slow the hands down enough for him to slip through the fingers, just as they clamped shut. Ken's claws retracted a bit as he reached for his back, drawing out his two long blades. By manipulating his tinketsu, he allowed a strong flow of chakra to bleed into both of them through his palms, activating the reserve of chakra within the blades, and imbuing them into a thick aura of lightning. But it seemed that the tailed beast had expected that. A ball of chakra was already at its mouth, the sand from all around them seemed to be attracted to it like a vortex. Die you little worm. Sandy tailed beast bomb. Ken's upward momentum was already far too much to be stopped quickly, but it wasn't as if he hadn't been expecting such a thing to happen. 
Without any fear or hesitation, he placed his blades above him in a cross shape. His muscles bulged once more as he swung them with all of his might, twirling in the air as he sent two oar slashes at the bowl. Sparks flew, the clouds parted, and thunder bellowed as the crisscross slashes clashed with the tailed beast bomb. The massive chakra was heavier than a mountain and more volatile than any explosive known to man, but this wasn't the first time he had clashed with one. Even if the one he had destroyed previously with his sword slash was incomplete, he still had experience and knew how to deal with them. Nature energy was the answer, of course. The wild raccoon's eyes widened as it realized just how much nature energy those blades were laced with, its body immediately seemed to part ways around the slashes, allowing them to pass through his body. Ken couldn't help but tilt his head at that. Its body is it not a fixed form. The assassin cut through the air a few more times, and sensed the giant raccoon part of its body several times, allowing them to pass through. Ha ha ha. Stupid human. You won't be doing just as it started to gloat, it was forced to shut up as Ken immediately turned his body into a bullet, and slammed into its back with overwhelming force. The tailed beast was sent barreling towards the ground, crashing in a gigantic cloud of dust, and sending any shinobi that was still nearby flying. So it can only do that for attacks it's aware of. Thankfully it's far from the fastest enemy I've faced, the seven tails had it clearly beat in that department. Ken cracked his neck and spread his wings as he lamented the tailed beast's strange abilities. The blind monster then brought both of his blades together, they immediately started morphing into a much thicker blade. Ken grasped the handle with both of his hands, and just as he was about to give it his all and finish off the tailed beast, he was forced to dodge to the side. A white cube immediately swallowed up his previous location. TSK. How much longer, Kazuki H. Anoki scowled as he flew around Ken hastily, his eyes not leaving Ken at all. I'm almost done. The Kazuki H shouted as his hands moved in a blur, looking as if he was about to finish a few hand signs. Ken certainly noticed that he immediately turned his head towards the Tsuchikage, who flinched. At that moment, the blind monster dashed backwards, twirling in the air as he reached the Kazakich within a second. The Tsuchikage had seemingly noticed his move already, and was preparing an attack to intercept Ken, but he was not going to make it in time. The Kazakich also tried to muster his own defense. A wall of iron sand tried to stop him, but it was no match against the assassin's chakra-covered blade. The spiky-haired Kazakich was immediately bisected, his torso flying off while his legs remained on the cloud of sand. Ken then flapped his wings off to the side, but as the Tsuchikich had already been preparing the attack for a while, the blind monster didn't manage to fully dodge it. He sacrificed his right wing and arm in order to get away. Ha! Huh. Finally the Tsuchikich didn't even get to be happy for more than one second. He watched on as his opponent's flesh twisted in an inhumane way, and how an arm and a wing seemed to regrow almost instantly. The absurdity of Ken's regenerative ability stunned him for a moment, which was certainly enough for the blind assassin. He dashed towards Noki, but he was forced to stop in mid-air with a scowl, swinging his blade down at a gigantic sand nail which was stabbing at him. Sparks rose as the assassin's blade clashed with the nail. But they didn't last long, he cut through the blackened sand without much issue. Forgot about me punk. The one-tailed beast was still alive and kicking, although Ken had used plenty of nature energy in his earlier kick, it didn't seem to have taken much damage. In the first place, tailed beasts were usually annoyingly durable. He had managed to kill the seven-tailed beast when using all of his energy and without being interrupted, and he didn't have the luxury of that in his current fight. You lot are proving more trouble than you're worth, Ken muttered as he turned his large blade back into his two thin longer ones. This tail beast's its attacks are either fast and pointed or slow and abundant, what an annoying raccoon. He pointed one down at the one-tailed beast, and the other at Anoki, who narrowed his eyes. It seems that I won't be able to avoid getting injured while fighting you two Ken gripped both of his blades, as he realized that he was now likely in the most difficult fight he had ever been in since coming to that world. And yet, he didn't feel any panic, nor did he feel stressed. He was more than accustomed to the odds being against him. But, just like in his old life, he was going to pull through. The blind assassin's lips turned upwards underneath his mask, he turned his head towards Inoki. But then his grip on his blades loosened, his ear trembled slightly, and his nostrils scrunched up. Really? Right now when I'm getting into it. It seems that I must cut our time short gentleman and beast. Ken then returned the blades in his hands to their usual look, before placing it on the seal on his wrist. What's that supposed to mean? Inoki scowled. His mind was still stuck strategizing ways to completely envelop Ken in an attack. 
After all, regeneration just meant Inoki needed to not leave him anything to regenerate. Not much, see ya. Ken just waved at him, and just as a few more nails of sand flew towards him, a cloud of smoke engulfed him. Inoki's eyes widened, as he watched the gigantic nails of sand pass through the smoke, and blow it away revealing nothing. Shit. He's escaped POV narration. TSK, to think he disappeared just like that Inoki scowled as the smoke that had enveloped Ken cleared. By his side, black sand twirled and came together to form a figure. A tall man with spiky black hair. It was none other than the Kazakij. It might be for the best the man who had seemingly just returned from the dead seemed quite shaken. Of course, you'd say that you seemed content with hiding around in the sand like a rat after your clone got killed. Anoki scowled once more, this time towards the Kazakij. Don't judge me too harshly, Anoki I've had my doubts, but the red dot is certainly worthy of his infamy. The Kazakij clenched his fist as he spoke, he seemed to be sweating heavily as he looked down at his bleeding arm. Even with the substitution jutsu prepared ahead of time I still almost died. His speed is simply unbelievable. What an absurd monster. The Kazakij was one of the very strongest in the shinobi world. One of the great cage. And even he only barely escaped death in a brief confrontation with Ken. Well, welcome to the current world. There's a reason why so many of us came together to bring him down, third Kazakij. Anoki shook his head and crossed his arms. The Kazakij could only shrug at that point. It's possible that he's more absurd than we expected. I'm pretty sure he turned his head towards me whilst I was still in hiding. Even stopping my heart momentarily, not breathing and stifling my chakra flow, was not enough to go unnoticed by him. The Kazakij decided to no longer speak about that, however, not wanting to dwell on it for too long. I guess I now know why the Mizukij didn't want anything to do with this whole operation, I'm regretting joining it myself still, it seems our intel on the Red Dot and the Dark Brotherhood's plans was quite thorough. That grass village informant seems to be worth his salt, Anoki muttered as he looked below, the one-tailed beast was already retracting into the body of its Jinchuriki, the flimsy seal reactivating itself after a set period of time. Indeed, honestly I have my doubts about our chances against that monster now. But the plan might still just work. The third Kazakij could only sigh after contemplating the situation a bit. His hopes were on their plan to succeed. Reverse summoning used in such a way. It's certainly ingenious, although a rather large waste of chakra to use it on a battlefield Inoki stroked his beard as he remembered the explanation he had received regarding the Dark Brotherhood's means. Maybe so, seems they have plenty of monsters in that Dark Brotherhood of theirs. The Kazakij crossed his arms and looked at the place where Ken had vanished. Anoki seemed to be thinking about something for a few seconds before he looked at the Kazakij and smiled in a shrewd manner. Ha, doesn't matter I wonder how confused the red dot is going to be. When he realizes that he's not been summoned to the right location. Ken landed on the stone floor upright, he cracked his neck as his senses adjusted to his surroundings, and in an instant, he felt several spikes stabbing into his body from all sides. It wasn't that the attacks were too fast for him to dodge, but that they had likely started before he had even gotten reverse summoned in that strange place. The blind monster growled as he felt himself being strangely immobilized by the spikes. It wasn't long before he realized that all of the stakes that had stabbed into him were adorned with ceiling formations. They weren't as powerful as the ones used by the Yuzumaki, but they were numerous, compact, certainly the work of a bright mind. Ken could only really move his mouth slightly, every other part of his body was completely immobilized. Ken dragon trapped in a cage like a rat. A sinister voice sounded out in that cave, Ken recognized that presence as one of the beings that had been spying on him throughout his journey. But he realized that it wasn't quite the same, it seemed to have something else attached to it. A blob of consciousness that Ken couldn't quite put his finger on. Seems Saburo did indeed betray us, huh? Figures. And what are you exactly? Ken tried to shake his head in regret but was unable to, so he ended up only slightly gritting his teeth. You can call me Black Zetsu you were a tad too trusting of the strawman. An ambitious man like him would normally dread working under anyone. When promised true freedom he readily accepted. Ken scowled slightly when hearing that. TSK, I gave him more than enough freedom. Seems like I'll have to rethink our partnership going forward. The blind monster's voice was carrying a powerful intonation. It was enough to strike fear into the heart of any regular shinobi that he would have run into. But the thing in front of him was no regular shinobi. Going forward. And what gives you the confidence to escape this place? It's a prison specifically made for you, with your specifications in mind. 
Saburo, the little snake, was crucial in the creation of this cage. Ken couldn't help but smile slightly underneath his mask when he heard that. Oh, that's cute you think I've shown him everything that there is to know about me. In an instant, Ken's already transformed voice started shifting unnaturally, and some of the seals around him seemed to start malfunctioning. It seemed that the very nature of Ken's being was shifting, and Black Setsu couldn't help but narrow his eyes. Hmm, I guess sealing him isn't going to be so simple we don't have access to any powerful sealing technique, unfortunately. The strongest Jinjutsu we have at hand is also visual in activation, which is next to useless in this case. The parasitic being couldn't help but scowl at the trapped monster's confidence. Even if you hit some of your capabilities, you are not going to make it in time. The Dark Brotherhood will be a thing of the past by the time you manage to free yourself, and we will only have you to deal with Ken could feel rage bubbling up inside him, in his mind the image of the ones he cared for appeared. He couldn't bring himself to imagine them dying. He couldn't accept such a fate. After that, all of our combined efforts will be enough to either permanently seal you away or kill you outright, that is if I am unable to kill you myself by that point. Black Setsu then plunged a wooden stake into Ken's heart. Or at least tried to, the wooden stake cracked and bent and splintered against Ken's scales, making the blind assassin scoff. Pathetic. The blind assassin's cold voice washed over Black Setsu, sending a few shivers down its spine. But it compassed itself almost instantly, even scoffing in the process. Black Setsu then brought out a different tool, a long special kunai, which he then imbued with chakra, and once again stabbed towards Ken. You can gloat all you want, but we were expecting tough scales. The kunai's tip struggled against the blind monster's chest, sparks rose, and eventually, after a few seconds of applying constant pressure, the parasitic entity finally drew blood. Try your worst but you better pray that you kill me in time, otherwise, I will make sure to end you and everything you care about. Ken didn't even hiss from the pain, his calm words seemed to unnerve the being slightly. Even in this situation, he clings on to hope. What gives him so much confidence? By Saburo's words, there was no one besides the immortal that we needed to concern ourselves with. The parasitic being was quite confused at that moment, trying to think of any factors that they might have overlooked in their planning. But nothing really came to mind, which prompted Black Zatsu to just shake its head and plunge another long kunai into Ken. He didn't take out the other one, to prevent the blind monster from healing. But even piercing his skin was difficult due to the toughness of his scales. Thankfully, the body of the Zetsu it was occupying was stronger physically than others. Even then, trying to pierce Ken's skin felt like he was trying to pierce a stone wall with a screwdriver. Seems like this will be FUN, the Black Zetsu lamented as it continued taking out various tools. Meanwhile, at the Dark Brotherhood compound, things were not going quite as they were expecting. The two-tailed beasts seemed to have finally escaped from their misshapen ceiling formations. It was supposed to be nothing more than a temporary prison regardless. Now all of the chakra of the Dark Brotherhood was being finally focused on defending just the compound. Tasho and Akira both stood on top of the main gate, both preparing for the worst, as they had not received any word from their master. Wasn't it time for him to get summoned here? Akira asked as he watched the two-tailed beasts wreak havoc on the mountain range that surrounded their brotherhood. I have a bad feeling about this. Tasho mouthed off before looking down at the center of the compound, where all of the pillars of the formation, the children, were sitting in meditative formations. The first blade's critical eye couldn't help but notice one of Saburo's clones heading for the middle of the village, an action that immediately aroused the suspicion of the already distrustful man. Akira, watch the gate. The first blade spoke out, tapping the third blade on the shoulder, before dashing towards the middle of the village, turning into a blur in the process. His eyes narrowed, as he felt more of Saburo's clones heading for the middle. The concerning sign there was no reason for Saburo to do so, none whatsoever. And it wasn't long before one of the clones took out a blade, and stalked closer and closer to one of the meditating pillars. Shit seems like my worries have materialized. I need to protect the children. But Tasha wasn't the only one paying attention. In an instant, that clone was slammed into the ground at inhuman speeds. Kicked by a masked teenager with only one leg. Tetsukio, the one-legged devil. What seems to be the matter Mr. Second Blade? The no point one prospect of the Dark Brotherhood looked at the surrounding clones with a cold smile. He slowly tilted his head as a cold and deadly murderous intent exuded off of him. He was initially supposed to be one of the pillars, but decided to leave that duty to one of his other siblings, deciding to take it upon himself to defend them to his death. Change of plans we need to take down the barrier. 
One of the stronger clones stepped forward, instantly deciding on a course of action. Oh, is that so? The teacher did mention that there won't be any changes. And to be wary of you, just in case the veins on Tatsukio's neck bulged slightly as he slowly unsheathed the tanto on his back. In an instant, countless projectiles were fired towards the pillars from all sides. Tatsukio couldn't help but sweat as he realized he couldn't block every single one. But he wasn't alone. More and more of his siblings jumped in, faceless masks surrounding the clones in their entirety. Unseen and almost impossible to detect, many banded together to form a circle around the pillars. And the rest were all already standing with their blades at the necks of Sabiro's clones. These clones are all mostly disposable, but I guess I had underestimated how well trained you all were. The strongest clone present spoke in a rather monotone voice. Its body then seemed to shift in strange manners. This clone, however, is not something that you children can deal with a patchwork of the Swordsman of the Mist, one of my finest works of art besides. He then quickly made a hand sign, choosing to sacrifice his weaker clones, as all of the children either stabbed them in the neck or beheaded them. Shit, get away. Tatsukio spoke out as most of the clones turned out to have explosive tags on them. The tags sparked and explosions ate at the entire square. But they then vanished in an instant, catching even Sabiro off guard. Oh. So you're here the Stroman's clone turned to the side and slowly stepped back, eyeing Tasho, who had already drawn the Samahata. Although the Samahata didn't like fire nature chakra, the first blade still forced it to eat up the explosion before it killed any of the children. I knew trusting you was a mistake I guess master cannot be completely right at all times. Tasho shook his head and slowly rested the wriggling Samahata on his shoulder. I never did see you in a fight, now did I? The strawman clone ignored the first blade's comment, instead slowly raising its hands, and preparing to make a few more hand signs. Let's see how well you fought the clone continued speaking, but was swiftly cut off as both of its arms flew off. Shut it. Tasho stood behind him, towering over him, the Samahata quickly munching on the clone's dismembered arms. The first blade cracked his neck, as the Stroman clone slowly fell forward, pinned to the ground by the enlarged and wriggling handle of the Samahata, completely unable to even move. As master's first student and most trusted right-hand man, I shall take it upon myself to rid the brotherhood of your filth POV narration. Saburo's clone's mask broke as he also felt his legs being swallowed up by the Samahata. TSK so you were hiding your strength. The strawman scowled while his eyes landed on Tasho. I was merely following my master's teachings. A good assassin always keeps his cards close to his chest. Tasho shook his head as the Samahata chewed on the clone's flesh with glee. HAHA too bad your master couldn't follow his own teachings. He attracted too much attention with his actions. This could have all been avoided. The strawman's dismembered clone seemed to gain a bitter tone as it spoke about the leader of the Dark Brotherhood. Tasho didn't seem to get offended when hearing the traitor badmouth Ken. Well, it was certainly an effective strategy in terms of forcing our true enemies to rear their heads like you did. After this is done, our brotherhood will be able to roam freely, without any worry about snakes like you lurking in the shadows. The first blade shook his head before swinging the Samahata down on the clone's back. Children, immediately undo all seals on you that are connected to the second blade and his clones. Tasho then turned to the children and nodded at them. Way ahead of you sir, I already told all of our siblings to do so when killing his first clone. Tatsukio waved at the first blade with a smile underneath his mask. Plenty of his siblings had gotten injured due to Saburo's explosive clones. Tatsukio himself was safe, and he had even managed to pull away some of his siblings, but without Tasho's interference, some of them would have surely died. But it wasn't like this was the first time Tasho saved them. He was the one to bring them all within the brotherhood at the end of the day. Then it should be fine hunt down all of Saburo's clones that are within the barrier, and form a defensive line around the pillars of support. Tasho waved his hand around and ordered the children with a stern voice they, all nodded and blurred away, Tatsukio included. Only a few of them remained around the pillars. What a goddamned mess the first blade then vanished, dashing towards his master's building. His mind was reeling, trying to understand the extent of Saburo's betrayal, and the full scope of what he was truly capable of. In his mind, he couldn't help but worry, Saburo could still interfere with the barrier they had set up even without killing the pillars. Thankfully the children acting as pillars are all instructed to block off their contract seals, otherwise, Saburo could have destroyed the barrier without any issue Ken had made sure to take many precautions to ensure that the pillars of support for the barrier around the brotherhood, were not going to be disturbed. 
He had even instructed all of them to remove any seals that would allow their siblings to draw chakra from them. The pillars were essentially only supposed to draw chakra from others through seals, and nothing more. If they were to be interrupted, then the last line of defense of their brotherhood would also fall. Akira, the third blade, was surely already also helping in hunting down the other clones that were somewhat scattered within the compound. Saburo was a skilled shinobi, but when splitting his consciousness between many clones at once his skills became dulled, which led to even the children being able to deal with the clones. The only real problem was that they could coordinate like no other shinobi squad in existence, and that the more of them died, the harder they became to kill. Tasho knew that the children would handle everything within the compound, so the most difficult part would be up to him. The laboratory. It was likely deserted by now, but Tasho was sure that was where the bulk of the clones were located. There were around 65 of them in total, from what I remember I should expect at least 20 of them down there, the original likely fled long before this happened. I just hope Ken is not in any immediate danger. Fighting ensued and embroiled the entirety of the compound, Tasho felt the earth rattle as jutsu of all kinds erased the houses they had worked hard to build. But it was nothing to worry about, a house could be built back up from its foundation. And the brotherhood's foundation was the children and Ken himself. As long as that foundation survived, then the brotherhood was bound to thrive once more. Tasho passed by two other clones on his way to the laboratory, they seemed to still be idly guarding the entrance. They weren't able to react in time, both of them getting decapitated as soon as the first blade passed by them. The laboratory was about as empty as he expected it to be. Or so it seemed, Tasho received a strange premonition before raising his samihata above his head. He blocked a hand that had been grabbing at his head, and a strange seal spread on the living blade. Crimson seal, huh? Tasho muttered before flinging the clone to the side of the room, smashing him into the wall before shaking the samihata slightly. The seal was undone rather quickly, not that it would have done anything to the samihata, as it required the victim to have a human-like chakra network in order to work. But the failed ambush wasn't really concerning to Tasho, what felt more concerning was that he was now completely surrounded from all sides by masked clones. I guess I wasn't the only one hiding things seems you've made more clones than reported, I knew your clones felt weaker than usual, maybe you're spreading yourself out too thin. Tasho scowled while the samihata twirled around him and bared its teeth. Of course I am this is a special occasion. It was difficult enough to create this many clones away from the red dot's gaze, I need to make use of all my resources to make sure everything goes well. One of Saburo's clones spoke with calm as the others seemed to be preparing for a fight, making hand signs and preparing jutsu which Tasho mostly recognized. Nothing will be going well for you the first blade brandished his living sword while speaking in a calm manner, not letting his frustration and worry affect his thought process. Many of the clones around him were amongst the strongest that Saburo had, and as the weaker ones above ground died off, the ones he was now up against, were going to be both stronger and more difficult to deal with. But that wasn't the first precarious situation that Tasho had found himself in. Even as all of the clones around him formed a frying line of various jutsu he stood calm. It seemed that Saburo's arsenal was rather expansive, ranging from fireballs to dragon bullets to water dragons and even wind blades. They all rushed towards Tasho, filling the room with light. The first blade only gave the strawman a compass sigh before gripping the living blade in his hand. Like a snake, the Samahata coiled around Tasho's body, absorbing all of the attacks with glee, before spreading out once more, lashing out in a circle, and slashing at all of the closest clones in the same swipe. But Saburo was clearly prepared for that, all of the clones took a few steps back, crowding the room a bit, while Tasho let go of the Samahata, and did a few hand signs of his own. I may be outnumbered, but you've not made the smartest move in choosing to fight me in such an enclosed space. The first blade spoke out as he finally finished his technique. Wind release. Great vacuum wave. The first blade took a deep breath, in an instant, Saburo's clones felt like they were suffocating, as all oxygen in the room vanished. Then, with a huff and a scowl, Tasho immediately started exhaling. The air came out of his mouth like a concentrated stream of pressure. The first blade then immediately spun around while continuing to exhale, the Samahata immediately ducked as waves of sharp air cut through the entire room. Saburo's clones acted quickly too, some rose earth walls all the way up to the ceiling, but they were swiftly crushed by the air pressure. Some had also tried using fire-style jutsu, but due to the low oxygen, they were mostly unsuccessful. Limbs flew around in that enclosed space, as the vacuum wave washed over all of the clones. 
Some were cut in two, some were simply left with an arm less. Air quickly entered the room again, as Tasho's attack also struck down the sturdy door that had closed behind him. All in all, only around 10 clones had been lost, and more were injured and missing limbs, but at least the first blade was successful in his task of thinning the herd. TSK, and here I was hoping that you would go down easily, one of the clones spoke out with a spiteful tone. In an instant, the ground under Tasho's feet broke, and three pairs of hands reached out to grab at his feet. The first blade immediately jumped, the Samahata rushing into his hand as he swiped at the clones that had tried sneaking up on him once more. You'll have to try harder than that. He shouted as he cleaved apart the clones underneath him. Only one of them managed to substitute, not losing its life in the process. Saburo seemed to be getting even more annoyed at that point, and some of his clones immediately started preparing for a combination jutsu. Tasho noticed that and immediately dashed towards them, only to be stopped by four different clones, all brandishing different blades. They all clashed with the Samahata together, crossing their blades and stopping the first blade in his tracks, while some others tried to stab at him from behind. But the Samahata wasn't a simple blade, it immediately expanded and twisted to block the attacks coming from behind its user. The blade moved in an unnatural manner, immediately starting to shred apart the blades that had been stuck in between its scales. Tasho then swiped his elongated living blade, forcing all of the clones to take a step back. You're right it was a mistake to fight you here. How about we take this outside then? In an instant, six different clones tapped the ground at their feet. Earth release. Moving earth core. Six voices could be heard all at once as the entire room started shifting unnaturally. Tasho scowled as he tried to brace himself as best he could. Earth-style ninjutsu of such scale in an underground setting could only really mean one thing they were trying to make a cave-in. But the worst part was that Tasho could see how they were first making the laboratory's insides bigger. Shit, don't tell me Tasho immediately felt his entire body shake as the walls, floor and ceiling around him filled with cracks. Saburo seemed to almost read his thoughts as he gleefully started laughing. Indeed. Why don't we bring the Brotherhood down a few pegs? Tasho immediately dashed at the clones performing the jutsu, but he was already far too late. The crack spread and expanded, and before he even made it to them, the ceilings started collapsing. Shit the Brotherhood is sinking. Outside, the effects of Saburo's actions could clearly be felt. Tatsukio panted a bit as he took out his tanto from the skull of the last clone he had found in the compound. He and his siblings were hard at work, hunting down the one that had betrayed their trust. What they didn't expect was for the ground underneath their feet to break. In an instant, the entire brotherhood seemed to collapse. The children acted quickly, jumping off on some buildings while doing their best to try and remain above ground. The one-legged assassin then looked at the sky, only to notice that it had lost its red tint, shit. The barriers fallen. The earthquake and sinkhole had certainly managed to disturb the pillars, causing them to lose concentration. The four red yang formation was both powerful and complex, and the children acting as pillars were not yet at the level of mastery where they could maintain it during such chaos. Saburo would have known that as well had he ever bothered paying attention to the children. Had he done so, then he could have sunken the brotherhood from the beginning, and not even sacrificed as many clones as he did. Regardless, now things were taking a turn for the worse. Tatsukio shouted for his siblings to prepare for the worst, but he realized that they didn't have enough time to set up another barrier. Back at the front gate Akira slowly sat back up. He had returned there after taking care of a few clones. And now that the barrier had fallen, he had a bigger threat to address. Well shit. He uttered as he stood in front of two enraged tailed beasts brimming with power and bloodlust. The monsters wasted no time at all, both pointing their tails to the skies, as two gigantic spheres of chakra gathered above their mouths. One's chakra took the form of condensed steam, the others took the form of pure magma. I can't let that hit the brotherhood. The third blade clenched his fists before turning into a blur, he dashed into the forest in front of him, his aim set. In an instant, the two tailed beasts fired off. Tailed beast lava bomb. Tailed beast steam bomb. The two tailed beasts repeated their attacks from earlier, this time, there was no barrier stopping them from erasing the compound in its entirety. But just as they pointed their mouths forward, a figure appeared in front of them. They both immediately recognized it as the third blade, currently in mid-air and finishing up a jutsu. What a release. Great waterfall technique. In a desperate bid to stop the tailed beast bombs, Akria threw himself in front of them, and released a gigantic wave of water 
using up a lot of chakra to spit it out of his mouth, in hopes of combating the tailed beast's attack in any way. Even more steam appeared as the gigantic wave Akira spat out, flooded the forest in front of him, and made contact with the pressurized steam and magma. In a few seconds, the water he was spitting out was overwhelmed purely by the massive force they were up against. And in the end, the third blade was forced to block those two-tailed beast bombs with his body. He gritted his teeth and spread out his arms, preparing for the worst. And just as he closed his eyes, he heard a loud shout. Y-E-A-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H
The army they had with them should have technically been enough to deal with the Brotherhood, but it seemed that their informant had run into some issues, as he was seemingly unable to deal with the Blades and the children. Their few thousand shinobi would still prove to be sufficient if it was an open battle, but they were in enemy territory. And the enemy were assassins trained by the Red Dot. In the end, Han and Rashi only really had one objective, now that things had devolved to that point. Wait for reinforcements they needed to stall out the wreckage and Killer B, the two factors that their leaders hadn't accounted for. They needed to stall the Cloud Duo until the army that was supposed to be dealing with Ken arrived to assist. With another tailed beast and two great cage, their chances would increase greatly. And when fighting a battle of endurance, that was what Jin Shuriki were best at. The third rakage was eventually forced to jump away from the fallen five-tailed beast. Han released a strange roar and spread out a thick layer of flesh melting steam around his body. The rakage wasn't affected by it outwardly thanks to his lightning armor, but that didn't mean he could breathe in that steam. It was hot enough to melt someone's lungs, and although the rakage's internal organs were strengthened as well to some degree, it was better not to risk things. Han was also well aware of that. His only real shot at damaging the rakage was by forcing him to breathe in his steam. But that was easier said than done, with a massive advantage in speed, and trained lungs, the rakage could still blitz into his cloud of steam, beat the shit out of him, and leave before needing to take a breath. Still, Han's answer was obvious when remembering his goal. Stall him for as long as possible. In an instant, his form retracted into his body, becoming smaller, yet still covered in a white mist-like chakra that formed four tails at the end of his tailbone. Unlike most other Jinchuriki, when using the chakra of his tailed beast and unleashing up to four tails, Han's body was still visible through the thick layer of steam-like white chakra. Even in human form, Han was a man larger than most, his body was mostly covered in red and black armor, and the lower part of his face was also covered in a red mask. The wreckage scowled when seeing that, realizing that Han had made himself a smaller target on purpose, and immediately knowing his objective. In an instant, the wreckage had already almost fully closed in the distance between them, startling the five tails Jinchuriki. But Han was an experienced shinobi, already well aware of the wreckage's overwhelming speed. And he had already prepared something. Boil release. Impurity cleansing steam lands. In an instant, the wreckage felt himself being pushed back by pressurized steam. It was like a bomb of steam had just gone off in front of him, and he was sent flying backwards a few dozen meters before he dug his legs into the ground with a scowl on his face. But the true aspect of that jutsu had only just started. The wreckage's eyes immediately felt strained from the heat, as he noticed that everything, for as long as his eyes could see, was covered in that same flesh-melting steam. Han himself sweated a bit when he heard the pain screams of some of his allies. Many had started advancing towards the Brotherhood, in a bit to escape the mortal exchange between the other two tailed beasts. This led to many now being trapped in an area with low vision where the air itself was trying to melt the skin off their bones. But it couldn't be helped. Han realized it from the moment that the Cloud Duo had shown up. We'll have to go all out if we so much as want to survive. That was true for both him and Rashi. What an annoying brat. The third rakage spoke through clenched teeth as he held his breath in to the best of his ability. His eyes narrowed in anger as the lightning armor around him intensified. This is just the beginning, Lord Rakage. Han's stoic voice was also somewhat strained, his throat somewhat sore from spitting out that much steam in such quick succession. But he would get over it. Loyal release. Bone blistering box. The Jinchuriki's arms moved quickly, his next jutsu already prepared, while the rakage was still regaining his bearings. In an instant, the wreckage felt the mist around shifting rapidly, it was all condensing around him, forming what looked to be a rather sturdy barrier. TSK, what a waste of effort. The wreckage wasted no time. Dashing towards one of the thick walls with his hand already extended. Four of his fingers were extended forward, and a spear of black lightning chakra formed around his hand, sharper and thicker than anything Han had ever seen. Just as he reached the steam wall, he brought three of the fingers, and in an instant, the spear of black lightning became even sharper, more pointed. One finger held stab. The wreckage's voice boomed as the steam around him was blown away, his hand passed through the solid wall of steam without any issue. It was almost a bit too easy. But then again, the wreckage was using his strongest form, aiming to end the fight quickly. Still, he felt the steam hug around his arm tightly as it passed through. Without any hesitation, he turned his entire body into a spear and passed through the wall with ease. He felt a slight burning sensation as he closed his eyes and reached the other side. 
The second he did so he was met with another trap. The ground underneath his feet seemed to have turned into mud. He felt his legs sinking quickly as his eyes shot wide open. Earth release. Swamp of the underworld. The jutsu was clearly powered by the chakra of the tailed beast, making the mud extra sticky and annoying to deal with. But in the eyes of true strength, it was all just petty tricks. The rakage stomped with force, and in an instant, the technique underneath him broke. All mud and steam was blown away from his vicinity, as the earth itself cracked underneath his strength. Still, that action seemed to be exactly what Han had wanted, as the rakage's vision was now affected. The steam released from Han's body intensified, and the area around him immediately became harder and harder to see through. Han's chakra tails moved upwards, all pointing towards his covered mouth. In an instant, all of the steam he had released started twirling and condensing into a ball of swirling concentrated chakra right above his mouth. It all took seconds, and just as the rakage's vision improved, he realized that he was staring down the miniature version of one of the strongest attacks that Jinchuriki could use. Boiling tailed beast bow, but just as Han was about to release that attack, his entire body froze up, and the beast inside of him screamed a warning. WHOOPS I've been SPOTTEDA masked man with a gigantic blade, looking more akin to a butcher, was already behind him. Han immediately recognized his mask the third blade, the one they were told to be more cautious against. Shit. I was focusing too much on the wreckage. Han cursed internally as the gigantic blade swiped towards him from behind, his eyes widened as he felt its chakra enhanced edge cut slightly into his shoulder, before he immediately rolled to the side. The tailed beast bomb he had been preparing to release immediately detonated, creating a large explosion which sent the third blade flying backwards, his mask cracked and his skin melting, showing off the red muscle underneath. Han panted a bit, recovering quickly from that near-death experience while internally berating himself. At least that monster is dead just as he was thinking that the third blade immediately stood up, his exposed muscles quickly being covered in a layer of skin. So the rumors were true Han could only narrow his eyes, while his tails immediately lashed out and pushed him to the side. The ground where he had been standing was immediately cracked and splintered, as the rakage landed there while trying to decapitate him with an axe kick. A rhythmic whistle could be heard as the third blade walked and stood beside the glowing third rakage. Parts of his mask were falling off, revealing a devilish smirk as he dragged his massive regenerating blade on the ground. Glad to see you're still alive. The wreckage spoke briefly, greeting Akira while also not wanting to waste his breath. H-E-H how else would I be? I can hardly die. He then slowly raised his massive blade and ran his fingers across its edge, scowling a bit as he scraped some dried blood off of the edge. That's good. Let's take this bastard down then. The rakage became more spirited, realizing that Han's tricks weren't going to work that well on someone who could ignore his techniques fully. I'll take care of anything with my strength and speed, the two of us can easily look for an opening will, take him down. He's already halfway dead Akira laughed a bit at the end, slowly licking the dried up blood on his fingernails. The rakage scowled a bit when seeing that, finding the scene a bit disturbing then he remembered the strange cult that he had fought in the past, and the rituals that Ken had described. The immortal assassin seemed to draw a strange pentagram on the ground, which quickly glowed red. In an instant, his entire body was covered in tattoos, most of his skin turning black, only the white outline of a skeleton showing on the parts of his body that were visible. Curse technique. Death controlling possessed blood. Akira clapped his hands together as the technique finalized. Han was confused for a second before he finally felt it. His lungs were burning up, as Akira freely breathed in his steam. He immediately spat out blood as he crouched, clutching at his chest. W what his eyes trailed towards the immortal assassin, who was just giving him a calm smile. Then he heard the tailed beast within him mention that a connection had been made between their bodies, and the situation finally clicked. Well then, mind if I do the honors. The wreckage laughed, finding the scene amusing. The enemy that had been giving him trouble earlier was now a writing mess. Of course not, just don't stain my clothes too much. Akira shouted as the wreckage smiled and nodded. Haha, I'll try not to. In an instant, the wreckage's arm formed a spear, and that spear ran through the third blade's chest cleanly, burning a hole through it, and exiting the other side in a second. The sea made Han's eyes almost pop out of their sockets in shock. And the damage was immediately transferred. From that point on, he couldn't even muster any last words as the light was snuffed from his eyes. The rakage looked at the scene with satisfaction, his arm still holding up the third blade's body. Hey big guy, mind taking your fingers out of my heart. 
Akira tapped the burly man's forearm with an annoyed look, gaining another laugh from the rakage, who immediately pulled his arm out and turned his black lightning armor off. Good that was much easier than I expected. I still need some rest though, the rakage slowly panted as the steam around the battlefield seemed to die down. I'll go check on the others the and go to the compound and rest, leader isn't around right now, but we'll handle things from here, I'll just ask you to protect the kids, I'm sure that's what he'd want to. Akira wasn't one to give around orders. But the situation was serious enough, so he didn't feel like joking around constantly either. The Rekage also didn't protest, he could see many shinobi now starting to approach them, since the field of steam had died down. So he gave the third blade one last smile before dashing off. Letting him handle the situation from there. Akira sighed as he watched him leave. He then turned around and slugged his gigantic sword on his shoulder. His eyes scanned the army of shinobi that had gathered around him. Well then let's dance, shall we POV narration? Pillar B roared in his tailed beast form as his tail smashed around the battlefield. Slight burns covered his gigantic body, as he constantly clashed with the four tails magma covered body. We won't win any time soon at this rate Killer B narrowed his eyes when he heard the voice of the tailed beast that resided within him. Having to face off against a tailed beast would never be easy. The fact that B wanted to end things quickly didn't make things easier for him. Jiki, the eight-tailed beast, was also seemingly not that excited about having to take on and kill one of its brothers, but it was still cooperating with B. There was also the fact that Jayuki was special. For a tailed beast, its tails dictated the amount of chakra within their bodies, their raw power per se. So Jayuki surely had more power than its four-tailed brother, Son Goku. But that wasn't truly the case. Each tailed beast had its chakra nature and specific unique traits. Shikaku, the one-tailed beast, had absolute dominion over sand, and the ability to turn its body into sand at will, making it a dangerous opponent, despite having the least chakra among them. Matatapi, the two-tailed beast had control over and had its body completely covered in blue flame. It was something she could use both defensively and offensively to great effect. So on and so forth. Sun Goku, the fourth-tailed beast had absolute control over magma, and it could also completely cover its body in magma making it hard to get close to, and hard to fight. While its magma wasn't as hot as the blue fire of Matatabi, it was still difficult to deal with, and it seemed to almost cling to the body. In a way, things had a way of evening themselves out in the world. Jayuki, despite having a lot more chakra than Sun Goku, didn't really have a distinctive trait besides its control over ink. It was still a powerful unique trait, sure. It could be used in many ways, but it wasn't all that great offensively or defensively for that matter. Ink was good at blinding others, and taking them by surprise. It was how Octopus also used their ink in nature. But Jayuki and Killer B both knew that such a thing would never work on Sun Goku, who was already well aware of said ability. He couldn't even make proper distance and pelt it with tailed beast bombs, as now Rashi was surely going to constantly close the distance between them to keep up the advantage. We're in a bind, can't deny, partner, oh my, stuck in this place, searching for a way to end this fillet bee's melodic voice sounded a bit distraught. He knew that even if the rakage finished his opponent quickly, he wouldn't be able to assist much. As a jinchuriki, bee had a bit more stamina than the rakage. Although the rakage was still monstrous, traveling for a whole day at full speed and then fighting a tailed beast was sure to drain him quite a bit. To make matters worse, they had no way of knowing when or if reinforcements for their enemies would arrive. After all, if so many villages had formed such a large alliance to go after the Dark Brotherhood, they surely had sent a lot of people to go after Ken too. But B wasn't all that worried for the Red Dot's safety at first. After all, he was well aware of how powerful their blind assassin friend was. But the problem to him was that there were people in the alliance who should have also been aware of Ken's power. Like the Tsuchikich. They surely got plans, no lie, they're prepped for HIM what's your take, Jayuki. Let's vibe on this, it's GRIMB's inner rapping voice didn't stop, even as he wrestled with Rashi, clashing tails and blasting away magma with the shockwaves from his other tails. He was also trying his best to attack as many shinobi as possible. After all, many had started heading for the compound already, which was concerning, to say the least. There were still too many of them, at least a few thousand left. Most of the corpses scattered around were mere cannon fodder, so things were still not looking all that great overall. Hmm, if I were to take a guess they're likely planning to seal him. Whether or not it'll work, I can't say for sure. 
Jayuki also mused in the middle of combat, trying to understand what exactly the alliance they were fighting was after. I doubt their success, Ken Strong without a D.O.U.B.T., but let's put that aside, no need to pout focus on this fool here, let's take him out. In an instant, B started to shrink, reverting to a form that only showcased six tails, a pair of powerful bone horns, a visible spine, and a purplish cloak of thick chakra covering his body. Rashi seemed to be trying to grab him, but Killer B managed to push himself a bit to the side using his purplish tails, he rolled on the ground and looked up with a grin. In an instant, a gigantic red fur tail quickly tried to crush him from above, and B immediately dashed to the side, scowling as his body moved at speeds much greater than most could follow. But Rashi seemed to still be able to follow him. Lava release. Rapid fire magma bullets. In an instant, magma formed at Rashi's gigantic mouth, and he started spitting blobs of magma at B. The blobs flew so quickly that they seemed to almost melt through the sound barrier. B seemed to be rather calm as he danced around the battlefield, avoiding the bullets with relative ease. He didn't flinch even as he felt some of them pass by a few centimeters from his skin. After a few seconds of dodging and dashing backwards, the eight tails in Cherky stopped and smiled. Immediately, a hail of magma blobs headed his way, aiming to engulf him and burn him to death. But B's chakra moved much faster, forming a cocoon of tails around him. Magma splashed everywhere as they came into contact with B's chakra appendages. And as soon as the hail stopped, B's tail unraveled violently, sending that magma flying around everywhere. Rashi was already dashing towards him as that was happening. But his eyes widened when he saw the violet ball of chakra already gathered at B's mouth. B swallowed that purplish orb instantly, as his throat and chest swelled up unnaturally. Shit was all that Rashi could say as he immediately felt his entire gigantic body being engulfed in magma. He was still dashing towards B, so he wouldn't ever be able to dodge. Tailed Beast Bullets. In an instant, a hail of smaller size balls started being spat out by B. They immediately came in contact with Rashi's torso, head, neck, arms and legs. They caused several explosions, shockwaves washing over the battlefield, and uprooting whatever overturned tree was still around them. Magma also splashed around as the blast from the miniature tailed beast bombs sent it flying everywhere. B scowled as he quickly started preparing another attack. Earth release. Earth and stone dragon. But before he could gather enough chakra, a dozen or so voices rang out in unison from the side, and earth dragons immediately rose from the ground, they twisted and turned like snakes before barreling towards him, and aiming to catch him in their sharp jaws. B scowled as he jumped up towards the sky, in that instant, three of his tails grew bigger and swiped the earth dragons away forcing them to crumble in broken stones, and shotgunning them back towards the shinobi that had intervened in his fight. He then immediately turned towards the Rashi, but all he saw was a gigantic magma-covered tail crashing down upon him. He was immediately sent flying into the ground, breaking the earth underneath him. The earth deformed and formed a create, creating a localized earthquake that forced some of the Anbu and shinobi still around to jump away from it. TSK, to think you do something as stupid as looking away. Rashi smiled, his gigantic body slightly bruised from B's previous attack. Unlike B, he wasn't going to be making the same mistake, he planned to give him no time to rest at all. Lava release. Land of scorched earth. In an instant, the ground a kilometer around them turned to magma as he smashed his gigantic fists into the ground. It bubbled out of the ground, and Rashi started punching at the crater where B had crash-landed. The eight-tailed Jinchuriki had once again formed some sort of protective barrier using his chakra tails, but Rashi was now punching through them with pure strength. Lava also gushed out of the earth right underneath B, causing the four-tailed Jinchuriki to smile. Die you bastard. He smashed his fist once more into the ground, raising a cloud of dust and volcanic ash all around him. He smiled widely in his tailed beast form, as he pulled his arm back. His smile immediately turned upside down as he felt his arm immensely lighter for some strange reason, and he immediately gazed at his fist, only to notice that it was missing. How strange I don't remember or land of iron condoning such a conflict to happen in our territory. Rashi sweated a bit as he gazed at his right shoulder, only to see a familiar and rather infamous figure. A rather tall man, with long grey hair caught in a ponytail and a pointy short beard. His body was adorned in greyish samurai armor. One of the man's hands was on the sheath of the katana on his waist, while the other was on the handle. He seemed to have just sheathed his blade, and it seemed to be a regular-looking katana, but it gave Rashi an ominous feeling. 
Nifun the beheading general, he immediately swiped one of his tails towards the samurai. The samurai just jumped away, causing the four-tailed Jinchuriki to hit himself in the shoulder. Rashi flinched a bit, but that was honestly the least of his worries. He immediately turned around, and his beastly eyes widened. Just outside the range of his scorched earth technique, he could see the bodies of beheaded shinobi piling up, as samurai with chakra imbued swords cut through their bodies and jutsu alike. Thousands upon thousands of samurai poured from the foliage, their footsteps seemed to quake the earth, as they made a mad dash towards the unsuspecting shinobi. It was a bloodbath. Is looking away from me truly such a wise plan? At that moment, Rashi immediately shrunk into his smaller form, and he felt a gigantic blade pass right above his head as he was shrinking. TSK, Jinchurki and their annoying tricks, Rashi reverted into his real body, appearing more human now only that he was covered in a thick magma-like chakra that glowed red, and three furred tails sprouted from his tailbone. The four-tailed Jinchuriki couldn't help but sweat a bit as he looked at Mifune with a bit of fear in his gaze. Shit. They said that the Land of Iron wouldn't interfere, that this would all be done too quickly for them to react what the hell is this. Mifune alone was a big issue for Rashi. The beheading general as he came to be known in the shinobi world. Mifune was said to be on par with some of the Great Cage. Hell, he had even faced off against Hanzo the Salamander, survived and won his respect, something that not many people could claim to have achieved. Hanzo was someone said to be on par with the current god of Shinobi, one of the strongest men in their era. Maybe Rashi could win against Mifune alone, but their army was already quickly getting dismantled by the Land of Iron Samurai. They were specifically trained to deal with Shinobi, and a lot of Jutsu were ineffective against them, as their chakra blades could slice through many without even stopping once. Shit if our reinforcements don't arrive right now, we're all going to die Rashi gulped a bit as he eyed Mifune. The general simply sheathed his blade again and tilted his head to the side, narrowing his eyes. Hot to his side, another figure stepped up, a battered and bruised killer bee walked out. His chakra cloak had waned quite a bit, showing his real body underneath, only three tails were formed on his back, no longer looking as solid as before. Big thanks for your help, I was caught off my G-U-A-R-D. But with your support, we're gonna rise hard. Crush this fool. W-R-E-E. He immediately made the devil's horn sign with his hand and pointed it to the sky. Despite his burns and injuries, he seemed quite energetic, making Mifune sweat a bit. Is he singing? Is this what the kids are into these days? I should do some research into this, but that's for later. You welcome Jinchuriki. We don't usually work together, but you see, the Dark Brotherhood is our ally. We can't afford to lose them as they are instrumental to the land of iron's prosperity and stability him. You moved quick, like a lightning bolt chime did a bat signal your folks ahead of time. B continued rapping as he asked a rather pertinent question, making the general raise an eyebrow. So the cloud was also contacted, huh? Indeed. Yesterday a bat came by Lord Damon's castle, carrying a message about such a disturbance, so we prepared in advance. We know that Lord Ken uses bats as his summons, but it doesn't seem to be his handwriting nor the writing of anyone we could recognize. Mifu nodded as he looked at Rashi, keeping the Jinchuriki in check with his gaze alone. Mifu didn't give too many personal details about why the Land of Iron decided to act. He didn't want to reveal the fact that the Daemon had personally ordered him to move most of their forces, with just an anonymous message, that Ken and the Dark Brotherhood might be in trouble. And it wasn't just because Ken was a dear friend to the Land of Iron after all. Yu was still within the Brotherhood. If even a hair on her head was harmed by the shinobi that had invaded their land, then the very next second would be the start of an even bloodier affair. The Land of Iron would wage war against all of the lands that were even so much as suspected to have been part of the alliance that formed against the Dark Brotherhood. Mifune had no doubt in his mind that the Yuchi would break the neutral reputation of the Land of Iron, in the blink of an eye, if his daughter was harmed in any way. Hell, Mifune himself wouldn't even protest, he'd be in the front lines in seconds, with no hesitation. Thankfully it seems that the shinobi haven't reached the compound yet, so you should be safe. I haven't gotten to explore further ahead, but I think someone's stopping them. Well then, seems someone wanted us to come here and help let's deal with the fool in front of us. First B nodded to Mifune before turning his attention back to the Jinchuriki that had almost gotten the best of him earlier. Rashi just gulped as he realized that things were about to take a turn for the worse. POV narration. Inoki felt an odd premonition as he flew towards the Dark Brotherhood's compound. He, the Kazuki and the one-tailed Jinchuriki were all flying at a similar pace, heading for the same location. 
Below them, the shinobi that had survived the encounter with the red dot were dashing through the forests, jumping from tree to tree, while struggling to keep up with the Inoki and the rest. Overall, they still had a sizable force with them, two powerful cage and a jinchuriki that was difficult to kill. So why exactly did Inoki feel uneasy about the whole situation? Well, it was all going smoothly in his eyes. They had successfully held up the red dot, making enough time for the ceiling formation to be completed. It was an arduous task, and it wouldn't even have been possible without the help of the trader that the grass village had contacted. But that man, the second blade, gave Inoki a bad vibe to begin with. Would Ken have been that easy to fool? Was it truly that easy to have one of his closest associates be turned against him? It was just difficult to believe and even without that worry on his mind, there was also the fact that their entire operation was bound to be noticed by the other nations that hadn't taken part in the alliance. They were hopefully going to be done long before any nation had the time to respond, but there were too many factors that could go wrong. There were way too many ifs and buts for his liking. He had already been screwed over once for not considering such things, after all, and eventually, his greatest fear materialized. Just as they were creeping a bit closer to the land of iron, he smelled something strange sulfur. Not a small amount, it was extremely noticeable to his trained nose. The Jinchuriki at his side seemed to have noticed something as well, as his gaze turned to panic whilst he gazed down. Anokia reacted just as quickly, immediately looking down and shouting. Explosives ahead. Anoki immediately stopped flying forward as well, noticing strange objects peeking through the clouds. Carried by a strong breeze were paper bombs attached to makeshift parachutes. The Kazakiage and the Jinchuriki both stopped as well, and a large cocoon of metallic sand immediately formed around them all, including the Tsuchikage. In the very next second, explosions rang out through their surroundings. Anoki scowled and covered his ears as he felt them ringing, the metallic sand held strong, they were safe, but the people below had likely been affected slightly. More were bound to have noticed something strange though, so Anoki was not all that concerned. They were all trained shinobi at the end of the day. Still. Who the hell would prepare such a strange attack? The cocoon of iron sand retracted into the Kazakiji's clothes, the Jinchuriki seemed to have grown a single tail of sand, barely sustaining a half-transformed state while preparing for confrontation. As they had expected, most of the shinobi below were able to survive the attack. Now that didn't mean they were unscathed. Rather the opposite, many were now injured. TSK, we are surrounded, Anoki scowled as his greatest worries materialized. All around the clearing created by the explosions were thousands of shinobi, all of varying ages and statures. The still recovering alliance army was caught in the middle of that gigantic clearing. And as the shinobi surrounding them closed in, Anoki's eyes widened. Shit. In an instant, a gigantic snake barreled up towards the skies, its snout pushing directly into the unsuspecting Kazakiage at breakneck speeds. The San Village leader barely had the time to react before he was sent flying further away from his associates, that gigantic snake disassembling into smaller ones, as soon as the Jinchuriki tried to claw at it. Anoki was about to shout some orders, but a gigantic staff parted the clouds and speared towards him, forcing him to fly to the side, and sending the slower Jinchuriki flying. The first hail Jinchuriki recovered quickly, but was immediately kicked away by a gigantic frog, which jumped towards it like a bullet. The staff seemed to then become smaller in size once more, returning to its user's hands, a person that needed no introduction in the dust release user's eyes. Even he is here Anoki scowled as he then looked down onto the army of the leaf. Countless shinobi rose from the ground and from tree trunks, all wearing the symbols of the leaf. HOHO as nimble as always, Anoki. The Tsuchikage's mustache stood straight as he heard that voice. He gulped as he looked to the side to see the current god of shinobi. A rather average height middle-aged man with a pointy brown beard. He wore a black jumpsuit, with a green gauntlet that covered much of his right arm. He also wore an armored hood with a bandana-like forehead protector over it, tied with two long straps. That were currently billowing in the wind. On his back was the title that he held with pride third hookage. Hiruzen Saratobi was currently leisurely floating on a yellow cloud in front of Anoki. It was a strange technique that seemed to allow him to fly at great speeds, as he had closed the distance between him and Anoki in mere seconds. Few had survived after seeing it, but the Tsuchikage still knew the name of that technique. The Nimbus Cloud it was a special release wielded by the Hokage's summon, the Monkey King Enma. The skies around them seemed to be twisting unnaturally as well, as the Nimbus Cloud was also known as the King of Clouds. 
It gave its user absolute control over all clouds in their surroundings. What is the meaning of this, Hiruzen? Anoki asked as his gaze was now fixated on the god of Shinobi. He couldn't afford to look away for even a second, and give orders to his people below, who had surely entered a struggle already judging from the trembling earth and explosions that were ringing out. Well, you lot weren't exactly as careful as you should have been. The forests have ears, and your attack is a prime moment to help shift the balance of this war. Further, Hirzen didn't bother hiding his intentions at all, smiling as he watched his students taking on the Kazakiage and the Jinchuriki in the distance. TSK, you opportunistic old fuck. Don't think this is going to end well for you. Your Lee village had no ties to this war, you've done a great job of putting a target on your back. Should have stayed quiet like you did when the Yuzumaki were attacked. Anoki still tried to dissuade the god of Shinobi, wanting to avoid another dangerous fight if possible. But the Hulkage wasn't budging, instead he seemed to become even more motivated. Now now. This battle may not be directly related to our village, but Danzo decided to overstep his boundaries, and therefore turned this into an internal affair of the Leaf Village. We can't, in good consciousness, not get involved. The Hulkid shook his head while sat on his yellow cloud, his scroll-like staff resting on his shoulder. Inoki could only scowl and internally curse at the situation. He had somewhat hoped that Danzo was there secretly on the Hulkid's orders at first, but it was clear now that it had been wishful thinking on his side. Let us stop wasting any more time I have some paperwork to handle after this. The Hulkage then stood up, prompting the Tsuchikage to fly backwards, and immediately bring his hands together. Thus release. Detachment of the primitive world technique. An orb of light formed in the middle of the Tsuchikage's palms. That orb then turned into a pillar, and it immediately shot towards the Hulkage, who still smiled leisurely. Without any effort, the Nimbus Cloud at his feet pulled him to the side, dodging the Pillar of Death, milliseconds before it erased all of the clouds in his previous location. Expand, Enma. Hiruzen's expression turned serious as he thrust his staff forward, in an instant, the Summon Beast turned weapon expanded exponentially. It expanded at wild speeds, cutting through the air and breaking through the sound barrier, as it seemed to want to crush all of Anoki's bones in a single move. The Tsuchikage barely managed to pull himself back in time to allow it to pass right over his face. He didn't have time to move to the side this time, as the staff grew exponentially thicker as well, hitting him directly and sending him flying towards the ground. The Tsuchikage immediately twisted and turned in mid-air, stopping himself from coming in contact into the ground, only to look up and see nothing but the gigantic tip of Hiruzen's staff. Anoki braced himself and roared, as the staff crashed into him and subsequently crushed him into the ground, breaking everything underneath and quaking the earth below. Hiruzen stood on his staff with a serious look, his eyes narrowed as he then immediately jumped to the side, a gigantic white pillar engulfing the entire staff and shooting towards the skies, disintegrating everything in sight. On the ground, Anoki's battered figure panted as he looked up at the remains of the staff, only to watch them turn to smoke. Just a clone, huh? The Rock Village leader already knew that it wouldn't ever have been that easy. Hiruzen was an excruciatingly difficult opponent, hell he wasn't known as the god of shinobi without good reason. After all, not even his teacher, the second Hokage, had been able to claim that title after the first had passed away. Earth Release. Titanic Golem Technique. Anoki shouted as earth unfurled from all around him, all twirling unnaturally and coming together. All of the shinobi nearby were swept off their feet, many were forced to flee as a gigantic figure rose out of the earth, a gigantic earthen golem with arms as big as its torso, and legs as large as Shikaku. H.O.H.O. and what do you plan to do with such a slow construct? Hiruzen sneered when seeing the gigantic golem soar to the skies. It was certainly large, and surely powerful. But its speed was a weak spot, to the point where even the people below were able to dodge its footsteps. Anoki seemed to ignore Hiruzen's words, as the gigantic construct's arm moved to the side and swiped towards the floating hulkage. Hiruzen looked at it with a disappointed gaze, the cloud underneath him shining slightly as he prepared to dodge. Earth release. Ultralight weight rock technique. The entire golem seemed to shift unnaturally once more, and Hiruzen's eyes widened as he realized that the gigantic hand was already almost making contact with him. Immediately, the Nimbus Cloud soared, but it was already too late the Hokage was struck directly, barely managing to raise Enma in time to cover his face with it. He flipped in the air many times, and the Tsuchikage followed through, his fist already covered in a thick layer of sharp rock. Earth Release. Pointed Fist Rock Technique. 
Anoki's now enlarged punch was heading directly for Hiruzen's head, but in an instant, the Tsuchikich felt something touch his torso. He looked down to see the tip of the Hokage's staff, Hiruzen's body was bent unnaturally as he thrust his staff into the smaller man's torso. Anoki didn't even have time to blink, he was immediately hurtled away as the staff expanded in the Hokage's hand. He crash landed into his golem, he spat out blood as he felt the rocks break on his back, more and more pressure was being applied to him, all until he eventually passed right through the golem. Expand, Anna. Herzuin's voice shouted once more, this time the staff started growing wider. In an instant, right before Inoki's eyes, the entire upper body of the golem was broken and scattered, as Emma grew to an unprecedented size. Rocks shot everywhere, countless pieces of rubble falling on the shinobi that had been fighting below. Inoki crash landed into the ground once more, this time he panted and slowly closed his eyes, feeling many bones in his body cracked and broken, especially his ribs. Lord Tsuchikic. A voice that sounded almost too friendly and concerned sounded from the side, that Tsuchikage's gaze immediately turned to the side, his eyes widening as he stared directly into those of the one that had called out to him, Anoki immediately recognized him as Fugaku Ichiha, the young head of the Ichiha clan he immediately wanted to avert his gaze, but it was already too late. At Tsuchikage's frustration grew, he internally screamed as he felt his consciousness shifting completely, being taken to a completely different place. The specialty of the Shuringen, one of the many things that made its users so dangerous. Ocular Jinjutsu. Mission accomplished. Fugaku coldly stared at the Tsuchikage. The Hokage quickly landed right by them, smiling as he did so, only wiping a bit of blood away from the corner of his mouth. Good job Fugaku. Hiruzen smiled as he immediately called on his Anbu, who almost seemed to blur into existence while surrounding the Tsuchikage. Take him away, break his arms, he'll make a fine prisoner to keep the rock at bay. The Hokage waved his hand, and the Anbu grabbed Inoki and dragged him off, making sure to break his arms and fingers, and gag him as they did so. Are you sure it is wise to not kill him directly? Fugaku asked as he gazed at the backs of the Anbu retreating in the distance. The rock is sure to blow a gasket if we do kill him, I'd rather use him to negotiate a period of peace instead. This will do more good for the village overall. The Hokage didn't bother hiding his plans from the Ichiha leader, who seemed to nod at his words. I see it seems I still have a lot to learn, Fugaku sighed as he nodded, somewhat admiring the Hokage's foresight. You are barely 20 years old Fugaku, you have a lot of time left to learn. Hiruzen merely smiled and tapped him on the shoulder as he passed by him, before stepping back on his Nimbus cloud and going to assist his students. We've successfully stopped them here, as instructed I've done my part, I just hope Ken's plan can succeed from this point onwards POV narration. Haha <laughs> what the hell. Black Zetsu felt the body of the white Zetsu it possessed becoming tired, something that was completely mind-boggling. At that point, he had been torturing the blind monster for around 2 hours. And, during that time Ken had not made a sound of pain, not even the slightest hiss. Ken only really made any sounds when commenting on the torturer's skills, and sometimes even giving him random tips. It was genuinely infuriating for the black Zetsu to have to listen to all of that. It was true that it wasn't a torturer by profession, sure. It was too busy being the plotting consciousness of a ghost from the past, but the torturer still knew that what it was doing was supposed to be inflicting pain upon the blind monster. Hell, the entire point was to kill him in the first place, but nothing was working stabbed through the heart. It would close back up as soon as he pulled back the rod. And it wasn't like stabbing Ken through the heart was an easy matter either, as it took genuine effort for the body of the white Zetsu to pierce the monster's scales. Black Zetsu's only real peace of mind was the fact that not many of the seals had broken since the beginning, some seemed to malfunction, but the main ones that were keeping the blind monster in place, were active and working as intended. Really, that man, Saburo was it to be able to create something to hold down someone of Ken's strength in such a short time. He's worth keeping an eye on in the future. Black Zetsu continued to stab into Ken's body, piercing it more and more. He had tried going for the head and piercing the brain too, but that seemed to be a whole lot more difficult to do. After destroying the mask, Black Zetsu found out the hard way that Ken had no holes in his skull that led directly to the brain. His nostrils were too thin for him to pierce through as well. There was also the fact that the brain seemed to be no different from the heart, and it healed just as quickly when injured. That coupled with the fact that Ken's skull seemed to be much thicker than that of a regular human, led to Black Zetsu simply giving up on piercing the blind monster's brain after a while, and focusing on other vitals. 
You seem to be quite frustrated. Are you running out of ideas, perhaps? Ken's voice rang out in that large chamber. His eerily calm tone was concerning, but then again, it hadn't changed much through the whole ordeal, so Black Setsu had gotten used to it already. TSK, don't act as if you've managed to break any seals in the time I've been squandering Plan B will soon be on its way, and if that fails too, then that fool, Anoki, should hopefully be able to do the job, as long as you're incapacitated. Black Setsu shook its head before slowly turning around and looking at its table of tools. Ken was right, it was indeed slowly running out of ideas. Sure, stabbing him through the heart till he died was an idea, but how long was that going to take? Did Black Setsu have the time for that? No, no, he didn't. Oh, that's right, Anoki how come you didn't allow him to do this in the first place? I'm sure his methods, that weird jutsu of his, would have been more effective than whatever you've been attempting Ken's disimpassioned tone, seemed to continue getting on Black Setsu's nerves. But the fact that the blind monster was nothing more than a rat trapped in a cage made Black Setsu more comfortable. TSK, the Sand Cage and Jinchuriki were unwilling to face you alone. They didn't want their losses to be greater than Black Setsu seemed to instantly stop, a thick stone door opening on the side, and showing a white Setsu entering the room, panting. Be bad that the white Setsu didn't even get to finish two words, as its head turned to mush, a gigantic tail stretched above Black Setsu's head, and piercing the newcomer instantly. And in that same moment, the parasitic entity that was Black Setsu, felt a bone-chilling fear as it heard the entire formation behind him crack and break like glass. His eyes widened as he felt a gigantic hand grasp his neck from behind. No way. No fucking way that barrier was standing strong just seconds before. Black Setsu's mind raced, trying to understand how Ken had managed to break out instantly. I guess the time has come, huh? Ken smiled as he tilted his head, smiling at the parasitic being he held in his hand. W what have you done nothing really it's just out of you and your little alliance to think that the Dark Brotherhood didn't have any allies. By now, the cloud should have arrived to assist with the Brotherhood, the leaf should have intercepted the party that attacked me. And finally, the Yuzumaki should have already crushed the other reinforcements that were heading for the Dark Brotherhood, so the wait is over. How did you know Boo the Zetsu's eyes widened as it felt Ken's hand tighten around its neck. Its eyes widening were also out of realization, as its mind seemed to instantly connect the dots on everything. Shit the formation broke instantly, almost as if someone had made it weaker on purpose, all of our information was leaked, those fools from the grass village ruined everything. Sabura was never to be trusted. Just as the parasitic being came to that realization, Ken snapped the neck of the white Setsu it was inhabiting, before dropping its lifeless body on the ground. The assassin stood there for a few seconds, before turning around and whistling, leaving through the open stone door with a smile on his face. Out of the shadows in front of him stepped out a cloaked man wearing an empty mask. Everything proceeded smoothly, leader it was the voice of the second blade, ringing out from the puppet he controlled. Of course they did you did a great job, Sibiro. Ken smiled and patted the clone on the shoulder, gleefully acting as if everything was already over. Things had gone perfectly according to his and Sabiro's plan. Ken was sure that Tasho and the others were going to feel a bit betrayed at not having been included, but he needed the white Setsu spying on the Brotherhood compound to be fooled without any shadow of a doubt. He was sure that they would understand his reasoning. With Saburo, it was easy to fake betraying the Brotherhood, as he had absolutely no emotional ties to anything and anyone within it. He had done his best to make it believable, despite aiming to not kill any of the children at Ken's orders. After all, it wasn't as if the children could just get lucky and win against him, a seasoned elite jonin who had surpassed most of the cage of the smaller villages. He was also the one tasked with contacting the Dark Brotherhood's allies ahead of time, and informing them of the situation. Ken had placed a lot of bets in that situation, but he trusted his chances at each and every one of them. The wreckage was sure to come to the Brotherhood's assistance, same for the entirety of the Land of Iron, that much was not even a question. The more difficult allies that Ken had were the Leaf and the Yuzumaki. But the Leaf was involved through Danzo already, so Ken safely assumed they would get involved. It was still a stroke of luck that Lord Yu of the Grass Village managed to recognize him in the war room due to their past dealings, and that Saburo had managed to finagle that information out of him. As for the Yuzumaki clan, well, their gratitude for the last time Ken helped them was still extending quite far. Their leader had even requested a meeting with Ken, after he had found out that Ken had saved his daughter. No matter how much the Leaf had tried to cover up the incident, they couldn't quite stop Kashina from telling her brother whilst he was visiting. 
All in all, it made for a rather safe plan, despite its projected risks. It was nothing sir, I just hope we didn't go too far. I wasn't sure about destroying the compound itself at first, but I can understand why you would order me to do so. Saburo sighed a bit as he realized that the rebuilding efforts would set him back in his research slightly, but it was a small price to pay in his eyes. It made everything all the more believable. They didn't suspect you for one sec Ken stopped mid-sentence as he tilted his head and turned his face towards a wall, seemingly looking through it. It seems the rat has also escaped in the meantime Ken's senses extended far, he had felt the parasitic being detach itself from the body it had been inhabiting and sink deep into the shadows. You think you can sneak away after spending that much time near me? It was at that moment that the second part of Ken's plan was put in motion. I hope tracking that rat achieves the results that you envisioned, leader Saburo said as he nodded towards the blind monster, who took out a spare mask from the seal on his wrist and put it on. With enough luck, I may actually get to the one behind the scenes in all of this. You can start assisting the Brotherhood with the cleanup in the meantime. Saburo's clone bowed towards Ken one last time before both of them vanished. Ken was off to track Black Zetsu using the mark he had put on him. And Saburo was off to get in touch with the Brotherhood. The blind monster soared through the skies, and an ever-present smile resided underneath his wooden mask. He reveled in the fact that he was now one step closer to his plans. Taking down the mastermind behind the attack was a must. After all, someone with the resources to contact so many village leaders and convince them to band together, was going to be an obstacle in Ken's plans. Revealing my age was enough to make all of the snakes poke their heads out from the grass, but the spider that clings on the tree and just observes, is always the most dangerous. By now, all of the snakes had their heads cut off, so all that was left was to rid the spider of its legs and break its head. Hours passed as he flew at his greatest speed to keep up with the strange parasitic shadow. The Black Zetsu as it called itself. It seemed to be extremely fast, but Ken was still able to track it down. It was a special being, a blend of strange chakra and nature energy, unlike anything that Ken had ever felt. It was almost similar to the White Zetsu, but not quite, almost as if it was of a different wavelength. But it wasn't like all nature energy was the same, after all his was different compared to that of the Toads as well. But thanks to being able to observe the unique form of the Black Zetsu for such a long time whilst it was struggling to kill him, Ken was now able to trace its steps effortlessly. And it eventually entered a crack in the ground, one which led to a large cave. Ken tapped on the outer wall of the cave silently, feeling the vibrations within the earth as he pressed his ear to the stone. He could feel plenty of odd things inside, but he needed to first address the most important part the old man was now conversing with the Black Zetsu. The cave entrance was completely covered up with rock, no human was likely going to be able to break it without alerting those inside. But Ken was still going to try. He dug his hands into the ground, his claws turning sharper, more monstrous as he dug through the earth whilst making as little noise as possible. Eventually, he dug a hole through the roof of the cave and landed right in between the old man with spiky hair, and the black zetsu which had taken over the body of another white zetsu. He sniffed the air a few times as both the old man and the Zetsu seemed to jump away from him. Fuck Black Zetsu muttered as it slowly stepped back. Meanwhile, the old man's eyes narrowed as he also stepped back, albeit slower than the Zetsu. Ken could feel a familiar energy in his eyes the Shuringen. This seems more interesting by the minute. Let's see what the spider has to say for itself POV narration. Madara took a few steps back as his mind almost instantly filled with not so kind thoughts towards Black Zetsu. That idiot didn't even realize he was being followed Madara wasn't scared of Ken. Sure the little beast was powerful, but Madara had fought and defeated stronger foes in the past. In Madara's eyes, he was only maybe a bit better than the likes of the third Drakage. There were stronger shinobi before him, and they were going to be stronger shinobi than him in the future. So Madara had no reason to feel trepidation when faced with him, hell, had almost even defeated Hashirama in his prime, despite losing due to a backstabbing. However, the Chiha ancestor didn't hold that against his friend Arch Nemesis. It was his own fault that he allowed such a thing to happen, they were shinobi at the end of the day. It was his past as a great shinobi that allowed him to not feel any crumb of fear, even when faced with someone of Ken's stature. What an interesting development. An Ichiha plotting behind the scenes, I wasn't expecting this. Ken tilted his head with a slight smile underneath his mask, his pointed and spiky tail seemed to twirl around behind him as he did so. Madara gave the black Zetsu behind Ken a quick look, before closely staring at Ken's mask. 
The second can cracked his neck, the black setsu behind him dashed at his exposed back. And the very next second, black setsu realized that it was staring at the ceiling of the room, as the head of the zetsu it was controlling rolled on the floor. Shit none of the zetsu here are strong enough to even react to this monster's tail. Ken didn't even turn around as he flicked the tip of his bloody tail towards the ground, forming a nice red line on the dusty rocks behind him. That was quite tasteless. The blind monster shook his head and crossed his arms, tapping on his forearm while seemingly expecting something. Meanwhile, Madara was sweating a bit as he realized that the three Tomo Shuringen he was sporting could barely even follow the monster's movements. I am truly in no state to fight him, am I? I guess the rumors were true. You still haven't introduced yourself, old man Ken's calm voice broke the Ichiha ancestor out of his musings, its calm cadence held a veiled threat underneath it. The assassin was not asking for Madara's name, he was demanding it. Madara could almost feel a growl coming from the blind monster's throat as it spoke in cold command. Now, had he been back in his prime, this type of development would have been exciting for him. He quite liked Ken's guts all things considered. After all, Ken was a man-child who was not at all afraid to break the mold and seek out his own answers to the problems of the world. Madara could very much respect that. The only problem was that Madara couldn't quite figure out what the blind monster's goals actually were. None of his actions pointed towards a specific path. At some point he chose to stay uninvolved in the shinobi world, at others he hunted down specific shinobi, and even tore rifts into the alliances taking part in the third war. It was honestly jarring, and the Ichiha ancestor hadn't planned to get involved too much in the world at that point. Ken's entire existence was both unexpected and a mystery. The tablet hadn't spoken anything of this it provided me with a blurry outline, and a way forward, but nothing ever mentioned him as expected, ocular jinjutsu doesn't do anything to him. Madara's thoughts were once again interrupted, this time by a loud and sharp sound. Ken's tail snapped, whipping at the ground behind him in a threatening manner. Madara sighed as he realized he was pushing his luck. My name is Madara Chiha. And it seems that we were fated to meet this way after all. Madara coughed a bit as he introduced himself, his gaze then trailing towards the black zetsu, who was currently seeping through cracks in the stone, likely going off to possess another white zetsu. Madara Chiha. Weren't you supposed to be dead? Like a few decades ago. Ken tilted his head as he tried to remember the recent history of the shinobi world. It was true that it was feasible for Madara to have lived that long, people had lived longer at the end of the day. But it was recorded that Madara was killed by Hashirama in the Valley of the End. It was a rather large piece of news as it had weakened the Leafs' fighting force quite a bit. Some villagers had even tried to take advantage of the situation at that time, but even an injured Hashirama was too much for them to handle. The fact that the Leaf was still filled with powerhouses certainly helped as well. But one thing was for sure Madara was pronounced dead, confirmed by the god of Shinobi himself. HMPH, for blind man, you believe what is written down with too little skepticism, Madara sighed and decided to not treat Ken as he would a child. Doing so was likely going to cost him his life. Whilst he wasn't afraid of death, he had yet to complete the first part of his plans. Well, there wasn't much else to go off of. You're dead to the world and have been for decades without trying to make your presence known, so I'm assuming you're just a ghost now. Ken's scales seemed to recede into his body as he confirmed that. Madara was a legendary figure, sure. But the person that was standing in front of Ken now could truly only be described as a ghost. The Chiha ancestor was truly nothing but a shadow of his former self. Ha quite a rude way of putting it, but not wrong at all, my bout with Hashirama left me quite destitute, by the time I recovered fully I was already old, and he was already gone. Madara himself was not offended by the insinuation. He also didn't feel offended when he saw Ken return to a more human form. He realized that his only chance of surviving against Ken, was to try and talk him out of killing him. If Ken was a regular kid then that would be quite easy for Madara to do. But things weren't ever going to be that easy for him, were they? Interesting and why exactly would someone like you be conspiring to get rid of me? Ken stepped heavily on the stones at his feet. The ground around him cracked and a stone rose out from behind him, forming a small stool. Madara sighed in relief as he turned around and noticed a stone rise behind him as well. At the very least Ken seemed to be curious enough to indulge him for a bit. To put it simply I saw you as an obstacle, a factor that I couldn't account for, and that could interfere with my plans. Madara was currently debating whether or not he could try to get Ken to join his plans. To make him believe in the Eye of the Moon operation and the opportunities it offered to the world. 
but the ghost of Ichiha was still very much unsure whether or not Ken would agree with his ideals or point of view. Hmm. And what might your plans entail? And how was I interfering with them whilst minding my own business? The blind monster seemed to yawn a bit at that news, likely already expecting something of that nature. He had expected to draw out all kinds of people and make them rise up against him, each and every one of them with their own reasons to want to take him down, and all of them related to his aged talent. Not wanting him to grow into a future god of shinobi the likes of Hashirama, not wanting him to grow stronger and pose a threat to their respective, and so on. Essentially, he expected many rats to be afraid of what he could grow into. But he also expected the one pulling the strings to have different intentions. Ken could feel it, despite being uneasy, the old man in front of him didn't even have a modicum of fear inside his body. Even though his muscles had withered and his skin had wrinkled, his spirit was still that of one of the greatest shinobi to ever live. My plans are not something I ought to go into detail right now, but I will say that my end goal is to achieve world peace. The blind assassin tilted his head in confusion upon hearing that. It felt just a tad bit too convenient to him. So we have the same goal. For someone aiming for world peace, he sure was comfortable rallying entire villages against me, just because I could potentially stand in his way, doesn't sound like the quintessential pacifist. Then again, neither am I. That's an interesting end goal, one I can certainly get behind in fact, but how do you plan to achieve it exactly? Ken decided to show his interest, hoping to learn a bit more about the ghost of Ichiha's plans. Madara seemed to become a bit more uneasy when asked that, his old eyes narrowed as he scanned the blind monster from head to toe. I guess it's worth telling you. I've concluded that the only way to truly end the cycle of hatred is to get rid of hatred altogether. I plan to put the entire world underneath a Jinjutsu, to let everyone live the rest of eternity in suspended animation, whilst fulfilling their greatest desires and wishes. Ken immediately sighed upon hearing the details of that plan. Immediately, the only thought in his mind was quite judgmental. So he's given up, huh? If the only solution to world peace that Madara could see was to manufacture an artificial reality, then he truly was going mad. But at the same time, the blind monster could sympathize. No matter how much he thought it out and strategize, he simply couldn't imagine a situation where they could achieve such a thing as eternal peace. Even his plans would only work as long as he or his ideals were alive and his influence could spread. He was going to try and force the peace to last longer even after his death, but it wasn't going to last forever. Much like Hashirama, Ken was going to create a period of peace. Just that, a period. A future untainted by the greed and want of the warmongers that seemed to so often take the thrones of their respective countries. He hoped to create a period much longer than that of Hashirama, to give the world a true taste of what could be. And in doing so, Ken hoped that the world would allow that taste to linger, and that they would strive for it in the future as well. That was Ken's goal. But Madara seemed to have different plans. I see you have completely given up hope that humans would be capable of maintaining peace by themselves, right? The blind monster slowly shook his head as he spoke, making Madara scowl. TSK, hope. There is no such thing as hope in this world. You are still young, but I'm sure you've seen it or felt it rather. The despair that embroils the people of this world. I know we can put an end to all of that. With your help, I can do it much sooner. But that hand was never taken, as Ken sighed, and Madara felt his body becoming lighter. How Madara fell cold at that moment, looking down, his eyes widened to see that his hand was completely missing, and there was a blade stuck into his chest. He wasn't surprised, no he had somewhat followed Ken's movements with his eyes. But it still felt unreal. He had done so much to extend his lifespan, to see his plans to the end. But now, that he felt his heart stop beating, it all became clearer to him. It's a shame that I wasn't born earlier. I'm sure you would have been fun to assassinate when in your prime, Ken said as he turned around and walked away, leaving the old man to fall to the cold stone floor. Madara's last moments were filled with despair, but also jubilation. Yes there's still a way. Just wait you will live to regret this day. The ghost of the Ichiha swore with his dying breath. The blind assassin didn't even turn around, taking his words as nothing more than the ravings of a madman. The dead are supposed to stay dead, but I guess I'll see you in the pure lands maybe. Maybe I'll even achieve what you had strived for, but more naturally. Only time will tell. Ken shrugged, before stepping heavily on the ground once more. This time, everything around him fragmented, the cave walls shook and quaked, and the ground underneath him gave way. In an instant, a cave-in happened, and Ken could feel all of the zetsu below getting squashed. 
It seems Black Setsu slipped away while I was talking to Madara I'd track him down. But I don't have any way of sealing him right now. He's not exactly a tailed beast, nor is he a human. I'll have to look into that and hunt him down one day. But it might be easier to just wait for him to rear his ugly head again Ken vanished as the stones from the ceiling fell in his previous position. He reappeared back in the clouds, his wings already unfurled. Now then time to head back home. POV narration. Harashi sighed as he felt the blood leave his body. His vision was blurry already, around him only the smell of ash and blood could be felt. He had lost all of his limbs, his chakra had almost run out. But he was still alive, somehow. This bastard sure put up a fight. Mifune huffed by his side as he swiped his blade towards the ground, splashing some more of the four-tailed Jinchuriki's blood on the burned ground around them. Yeah, he did, but he played weak, what a tool, took him down, made him look like a fool. High five for the win, we stay c-o-o-l-y-o killer b raised his palm towards Mifun, who looked at him incredulously, not quite sure how to respond, or what the young Jinchuriki was trying to accomplish. B himself seemed to skulk and turn away after being ignored, merely mumbling a few sentences before starting to write up some new verses in his notebook. Mifun took one more look at Rashi, who was currently coughing up some blood and ink. Killer B had managed to drown him in ink at some point during their altercation. Although ink release wasn't powerful, it was still quite useful if the opponent was caught off guard. Both Mifune and B had worked in unison to dismember the four-tailed Jinchuriki, who was now just a small step away from dying. Both B and Mifune had various burns scattered on their bodies. Parts of the samurai general's armor were also melted off and fallen on the molten ground at some point. Rashi had truly put up a great fight, no matter how much B mocked him in his rap. In the first place, Rashi was one of the strongest Jinchuriki when it came to destructive power and combat ability in general. His love release was something that very few could fight. To the point where Mifun was unsure if he could have won had it not been for B's interference. But they had also gotten over the fight without gaining too many injuries, much to both B's and Mifun's surprise. Rashi was more focused on stalling than on killing them. Despite taking every opportunity he could, he didn't go out of his way to create said opportunity. He was clearly waiting for reinforcements, but that wait was for nothing by the look of things. Even though their fight had stretched out for around two hours, there was not even a sign of any reinforcements coming in. Instead, Rashi got a front row seat to watching the army he had come with get systematically dismantled by the samurai of the Land of Iron, and the members of the Dark Brotherhood. It seemed that the Blades of the Dark Brotherhood had also watched over all of its members and the samurai, involving themselves only occasionally to minimize casualties. Things became even more unfair for the shinobi when the third rakage recovered enough to join back into the fray. And in that moment casualties on their side were no more. All in all, the samurai had lost very few people, warriors that had met their end in battle, a true honor. There were also a few hundred or so that were injured to varying degrees. That was inevitable, however, since the samurai had a very close quarters style of combat, while the shinobi used plenty of long-range attacks. In an open field, the samurai still had a bit of a disadvantage, but they still prevailed. The Brotherhood had lost none of its members, but most were injured, and the majority of the shinobi were either dead, dying, unconscious and dying, or incapacitated in some way. And Rashi was now also counted among them. Shit Rashi could barely muster up the energy to curse his own fate. He had been one of the people against the invasion to begin with, but orders were orders. And because of orders, he was now going to die. And the only thought in his mind I don't want to die this useless death. He wasn't scared. He wasn't feeling afraid. But he felt as if his death was simply in vain. Son Goku within him was also already tired, the ape-like tailed beast only silently listened to his Jinchuriki's dying internal struggles. But what else was there even left for him? His best friend, Han, had also definitely died. Rashi hadn't gotten to see it with his own eyes, but at some point, his friend's steam had died down and vanished in the wind. You have the right to despair Jinchuriki, I doubt you were the one to start this war after all. But we are the ones to end it. Mifun took a step forward and grasped his katana with both hands. Rashi's tired eyes trailed over to the beheading general, and it only took a second for him to understand the man's intentions. I guess this is the end. It was an honorable bout, and thus, you have earned my respect. I will give you a swift end, befitting of a warrior, something I do not believe many shinobi are worthy of. Mifun raised his katana over his head and prepared to swing down, only closing his eyes in prayer for a few seconds. Killer B decided not to interfere in the matter, his fight with Rashi was already over, 
so he decided to run off to the third wreckage and regroup instead. I, I hope Rashi started speaking, some blood spilling from the corners of his mouth, as he struggled to spread his lips wide open to show a crazed smile to his executioner. I hope you burn in hell before he could even finish that sentence, the beheading general's blade came right down on his neck, sending his head rolling off on the burned ground. HMPH a shinobi till the end rest in peace. Mifune didn't let his execution be affected by the Jinchuriki's disrespect. Instead, he sheathed his blade and started heading for the remains of the Dark Brotherhood compound. By the time the samurai leader reached the compound, a commotion was already starting up. Mifune arrived to see a rather odd scene. The first blade held out a giant spiky blade to the neck of a man who was adorned in an attire very similar to his own. The third blade was also behind that man, with his regenerating blade resting neatly on the other side of the man's neck. The man in question wore a mask with two red lines down the middle, and Mifune recognized him as the second blade. You have some guts coming back here, you traitorous bastard Tasho muttered as he watched Saburo's clone with a hostile gaze. Now now, I believe I have already explained the situation Lord Ken had requested, that I specifically make it look like I betrayed the Brotherhood to help with his scheme, Saburo's voice was calm despite the circumstances. The second blade seemed quite unbothered, he was acting with great poise and composure in Mifune's eyes. As if we'll believe any of your bullshit. Akira, the third blade spoke out as his hand seemed to twitch in excitement. The madman seemed to barely be able to contain himself from just decapitating the second blade right then and there. You don't have to believe me. The second that our leader returns everything will be made clear. Saburo stated with his arms crossed. And that is the very reason why we haven't killed you yet. But well I guess we can also explain the situation to Lord Ken with just your head present, even if it's just a clone, you must be running out of them right. At some point, we'll manage to kill the original two Tasho's living sword seemed to tremble in excitement much like the third blade. But just before the first blade could act, he felt his living blade stop in its tracks, and he could see sparks rising up. Now now, let us calm down and take a few steps back. Mifune had immediately stepped forward and stood in between the blades. The general's katana was firmly blocking the Samihata, and his hand was firmly gripping the edge of Akira's regenerating blade, which was seemingly cracking under his strong grip. Tasho's eyes narrowed, realizing that Mifune had moved faster than he had expected. Akira also blinked a few times, realizing that he was a bit too famished to follow the general's movements. I guess he's the strongest samurai in the land of iron for a reason General Mifune, this is an internal matter of the Dark Brotherhood, I only ask that you do not interfere, Tasho pulled the Samihata back, and allowed it to rest on his shoulder. Akira did much the same, circling around a bit while whistling and choosing to stand at the first blade's side. Mifune sighed when hearing that, his hands were a bit tight in a sense. He didn't wish to overstep his boundaries and get involved needlessly. But at the same time, he hoped to not see any more blood be shed on that day. It's not that I wish to get involved, but if we are merely waiting for Lord Ken, then I do not wish for the situation to be this hostile. Enough lives have been lost today, and I don't want any more to be snuffed out needlessly. The old general's words seemed to resonate with some of the people listening. The third rakage for example, who just wanted to rest now. But they didn't seem to do much to placate the first and third blades. I understand your words, but I do not feel safe leaving that thing run around freely. Please step out of the way Sir Mifune this is the last time I ask politely. Tasho's tone was threatening, but even then Mifune refused to budge. First blade, I ask that you see my reasoning. Nothing good will come from the two of us crossing blades. Mifune was still hellbent on trying to mediate the situation. It also helped that Tasho was not quite confident in facing the old general. Akira was also almost famished at that point, so he wasn't going to be of much help if a fight broke out. In the end, as the strongest samurai, Mifune's power was much greater than that of Tasho. Tasho could be called an elite jonin by that point. Some could even say that he was close in power to a leader of a lower village. But Mifune had tussled with the strongest of the world, he was on a different playing field. That didn't mean Tasho wasn't going to at least try. But just as he took a step forward, his ears perked up, and his head immediately turned to the sky. In the distance, he could see a dot, the figure of a strange being, its wings spread out widely as it flew through the clouds. From seeing it, it only took a few seconds for that figure to appear right in front of him, the ground fragmenting underneath him from the landing, as a cloud of dust also rose. Seems I was a bit late, everyone could hear the sounds of bones crackling and shifting places, of muscles moving around underneath skin. 
and from the cloud of dust that had arisen, stepped out the figure of none other than Ken. Mifune sighed when seeing that, deflating slightly as he did so. The general may have been the strongest samurai in the land of iron, but it was no secret that Ken held the title of strongest swordsman. Intact and unbothered by the obvious tension in the air, he stepped up to Tasho and Akira, and patted them both on the shoulder. Good job you two. You did more than great Ken's voice sounded quite proud, and Mifun behind him had already sheathed his katana. HMPH, about time you came. The wreckage huffed as he shook his head. He was also preparing to jump in and stop a conflict from happening. Killer B seemed to still be stuck on writing lyrics, although he did wave at Ken, who unfortunately didn't see it. Ha I got a bit held up. But it's fine. Now then, I guess I should explain the situation, right? POV narration. It seems things are pretty lively here. Ken cracked his neck as his wings vanished, and he took a step forward, stopping right in front of Tasho. Lord Ken. I believe you may be able to clarify things here. The first blade sweated a bit as he looked at his master. His tone was uncertain now. At that point, he didn't even need to hear Ken's words to know that Saburo had been telling the truth. Otherwise, Ken would have already long since decapitated the strawman. Well, it seems everything went according to plan Ken then patted the first blade on the shoulder, and smiled underneath his mask. The first blade blinked a few times before nodding. I guess we'll continue this talk later still, to think that he'd do such a thing without no. I need to get those thoughts out of my head Akira seemed to be a lot less bothered by it, simply shrugging before going off on his own, likely to find some food. Unlike Tasho, he didn't feel as if he had been betrayed in any way. He was merely following orders throughout the war, and he also didn't hold any grudges against Saburo, as he assumed the second blade had been doing the same. He had suspected at some point that Saburo wasn't actually betraying them. Especially when seeing that the children could actually defeat him so easily. He was well aware of the second blade's limitations, and he knew that controlling multiple clones was strenuous. But having spent more time in Saburo's lab, he also knew that the limit of clones he could perfectly control was staggering. Only a few of the children really had any hopes of fighting him, especially his stronger clones. Only you, Tetsukio, and a few others really. Well, at least everything worked out fine the third blade shrugged as he walked over to the ruins of the Dark Brotherhood compound, heading straight for the pantry, or what remained of it. Whilst that was happening, Ken had already turned towards the guests of note. Namely Mifune and the Cloud Duo. The Samurai General had already walked over to their side, not wanting to involve himself in an internal matter of the Brotherhood any further. The blind leader walked forward to them and greeted them jovially, but not before he waved at Saburo to go and start helping the injured. The second blade nodded and vanished, and around 20 clones appeared on the battlefield, and started helping with the many injuries. 10 were focused on the injuries sustained by the children in the Brotherhood, and the other 10 were helping the medics that the samurai army had brought. The Rekage and B were both doing quite well, the Jinchuriki's natural healing was enough for the injuries he had sustained to get better within the next few days. And the Rekage was really only a bit tired. No one capable of actually injuring him had shown up. Maybe Han could have stood a chance had Akira not executed him in cold blood, but that was simply fate. Meanwhile, Mifune had sustained a few burns, they were certainly going to heal, but some were also likely going to scar. Especially a burn he had sustained from taking a magma punch to the cheek. Alas, Rashi had also lost an arm to injure Mifune like that, so the general deemed it a worthwhile trade. His beard had been slightly burned, but he was otherwise fine. Such injuries meant little to a seasoned warrior. Nothing that would make him stop fighting. He was going to be fine after a few weeks of healing. Gentlemen I thank you all for showing up right in the nick of time to help my brotherhood. The blind assassin finally greeted the three with a deep bow. While doing so, he also took off his mask and placed it somewhere within his cloak. All pretense was lost in front of them, and Ken wasn't about to pretend that they hadn't been crucial to his success. Had it not been for them, the plan he had chosen to go with wouldn't have worked at all. And, all that he cared for would have died if he had tried to attempt to go through it. It is only natural. Mifu nodded, his eyes glancing to the side for a few seconds, watching the children of the Dark Brotherhood, but likely only staring at the figure of you. The bloody princess hadn't gotten injured much throughout the conflict. Only a few scrapes and burns. But her body and clothes were still completely covered in blood, and it certainly wasn't hers. Needless to say, she was living up to her nickname. Seeing her safe made Mifune feel at ease as well. 
but he also sighed as his eyes rested back on Ken before they hovered over to the Cloud Duo and back to Ken. His message was quite clear for the assassin. But Ken wasn't willing to talk about matters later. I'm sorry for endangering you. I hope you and Yuchi will find it in yourselves to forgive me. Ken bowed once more toward Mifian, not bothering to hide his connection to the Land of Iron from the wreckage in B. The wreckage specifically raised an eyebrow, as he recognized the names that Ken had spoken. Well, it would have been odd if he didn't. Going into the territory of another country and not even knowing the names of its rulers, would have made him seem like a joke of a shinobi. He endangered you, the princess of the Land of Iron. The Rekage's eyes then slanted over to the members of the Dark Brotherhood, before landing on the figure of the bloody princess. His eyes narrowed once more as he looked at her blood-soaked blonde hair flutter in the wind. Don't tell me the Rekage gave a shaky smile as his mind put the pieces together. He had his suspicions in the past. Many had their suspicions in fact, there were several reasons why people called her the bloody princess after all. But he didn't expect to get actual confirmation from the lion's mouth. I see so you trust the two of them well, I will choose to trust your judgment, as you've yet to disappoint us. If you look to the side at the wreckage and B, before sighing. As for your apology, I accept it. I think Yuchi may be a bit mad at you for now, but I can handle his tantrums. He knew what type of life lady you would lead by your side. This is merely one of the risks. Mifun sighed once more as he crossed his arms and shook his head. Ken nodded and turned his head towards you for a second. This may be a bit more serious than a few tantrums, Mifun. It would be a shame to lose you now, she's very talented, and her talent has yet to even bloom properly. Mifun blinked a few times when hearing Ken's words. It was as if he was hearing the words of an old master talking about one of their most treasured students. Sometimes it's hard to remember that this man is actually a child. Not that I will ever be treating him as a child, that would be disrespectful to him and his accomplishments. The general smiled a bit as he thought of that before he opened his mouth and waved off Ken's concerns. I wouldn't worry about that. I will personally resist such a thing, but I doubt it will come to that. You herself would protest leaving this place vehemently. Ichi may be able to duke it out with me, but he'll fall on his knees the second you looks at him with those puppy eyes. The now then, Lord Rakage, Keller B it seems I've gone and done it, I owe the two of you a lot. The Rakage immediately waved his hand dismissively. Bah, don't worry about it. You've helped us plenty of times in the past there are no favors between friends. The Rakage gave the blind assassin a wide smile as he spoke. One that Ken ended up returning. Indeed. I feel a bit bad now for always taking payments when helping you though Ken sweated a bit as his smile shook slightly. The Rakage laughed out loud when hearing that. Ha. Huh. Don't worry about it. I was the one hiring you instead of asking you for help as a friend. I treated things like a transaction, so it is only fair that you saw it as one. The Rakage shook his head as he gave the blind assassin a complex gaze. I wouldn't say that. You've always made your intentions clear and always worked hard to maintain friendly relations with me and the Brotherhood. I've done a shoddy job at reciprocating this at times, but I plan to change that from now on. Ken's answer seemed to be quite pleasing for the Rakage. It was certainly a step forward in their relationship, but that was to be expected. I appreciate that but still, who would have thought that the bloody princess was an actual princess? I had speculated what ties you had with the land of iron plenty of times, but could never quite put my finger on it. The cloud village leader seemed to glance towards Mifune for a few seconds before turning back to Ken. Well, it was a rather closely guarded secret. But I figured that there was no point in keeping it any longer. At least not from you two. The blind monster tilted his head to the side as he spoke. His nostrils then flared a bit, as he turned his head to the side and smiled once more. It seems that he's the last one arriving, the assassin leader muttered as he crossed his arms. Oh. We we're expecting someone else. The Rakage and Mifune both looked in the same direction Ken had looked towards. B did the same, although he still wasn't contributing much to the conversation. In the distance, everyone failed to see anything specific. B was the first to notice it among the three of them. A yellow cloud. He muttered as he spotted something within the sky above, shrouded by the other clouds in the distance, yet moving towards them all the same. Ho. Oh. So it was him. The wreckage's mood seemed to sour for a few seconds, his smile turning into a scowl, as soon as he recognized the technique. Hm. Mifune didn't recognize it, but he did spot the cloud, which was flying towards them quite quickly. It eventually reached the cloud right above their heads, and that was when it started to descend. B and Mifune both jumped backwards a bit, neither of them aware of what exactly was coming. 
The samurai general even had his hand on the hilt of his blade, just in case. Ken and the rakage didn't react much, though. They stood completely still as the cloud landed right near them and dispersed in seconds, revealing a rather familiar figure. A middle-aged man with a pointy beard, wearing a pair of sandals, a black jumpsuit and an armored hood with a bandana headband tied around both his forehead and the hood. Everyone recognized him instantly, even if they didn't know his face, they knew the words on his back, the third hookage B and Mifune muttered at around the same time. The current god of shinobi, here is in Saratobi, had made an entrance. The general sighed and relaxed his guard a bit when he noticed that Ken was completely calm. H.O.H.O. -h 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 -h, it seems that I've arrived a bit late, Herzuin muttered as he wiped the dust off his shoulders, and looked around the battlefield at the scattered corpses of shinobi. I'd say you arrived just in time Ken nodded towards the hookage. Inwardly, he felt his mind jumping around in jubilation, as it seemed as if all the stars were aligning. Time to get on to the third phase of the plan. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.